What's up guys, my name is Alex, also known as Inch95, and I am bringing you guys a card discussion today on Pot of Desires. I know a lot of people have been asking me why I haven't done a video on it yet, and the big reason was obviously I didn't have the card, and I didn't really see how the meta unfolded. Obviously, I haven't really been playing too much competitively lately, but just looking at and observing at how, how the meta is really unfolding right now, obviously there's still going to be a lot of new stuff coming out in the next couple months, and it's crazy to think about, but uh, you know, since the new season is here, we can kind of evaluate how a lot of decks using Pot of Desires are, and... Uh, honestly, a lot of people have been asking me, do I think it's great in every deck? Uh, I think for the most part, in every like competitive deck, it should be played, at least from what I'm observing. Every like mainstream meta deck uh, seems to be playing this for the most part. Uh, obviously, there are certain decks or people that choose to admit it. Obviously, it's still quite an expensive card. I mean, relatively, uh, compared to a lot of other cards, I mean, right now, I think it's sitting around like 70 bucks or so, uh, which is obviously why I only have one copy. I don't plan on really picking up any others anytime soon. But the point being is, number one, it's a really expensive card, so some people are just, even that do play competitively, aren't necessarily always going to have the card right off the bat in these first coming weeks. I mean, it's been out for a little while now, but, I mean, it's still, it still has a pretty hefty price tag. But the point being is that, obviously, everyone knows you banish 10 and then you draw 2, so there's no really other, you know, restriction on this card. There's no, like, special summon restriction. Uh, the only real restriction is, obviously, you, you can only activate one pot of desires per turn, and it's obviously a, quote-unquote, steep cost of banishing 10 cards. And there's obviously the debate of people saying... You know, in Yu-Gi-Oh, is it, you know, is this card considered, you know, a minus nine or is it still technically a plus one? Um, it really depends on how you look at it. I think for the most part in this day and age of Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, both arguments can be made in a variety of ways. So the first argument being, you know, if you're saying that this card is a plus one, you activate a card, you get two cards for it, you know, you're replenishing a card, you're getting a plus one, right? Well, if you look at it that way, that's, you know, that's definitely valid. You're only looking at it in terms of hand, field, and, you know, that's really it. That, you know, basic advantage, hand and field. That's tr what traditional Yu-Gi-Oh! would account for. But if you think about it, um, it's, it's a little bit of a combination of both. So the second argument is obviously the fact that it's a minus nine because you're losing ten resources in your deck and you're drawing two cards, which you're thinning out your deck, this card replaces itself, it's a plus one, but then you lose ten cards. So uh, minus ten, the plus one, obviously that evens out to, to minus nine. Well, that's not necessarily accurate either. I mean, I can see how you're looking at it from like a resource point, resource point of view, but I think it's a little bit more of a combination of both logics. So uh, I don't think it's an immediate, like in terms of just pure advantage, uh, like for what it's worth, like when you're playing the game, the way that Yu-Gi-Oh has evolved, which I'm going to be d doing a discussion, hopefully either on Team uh, Team APS's channel, on Paul's channel, or maybe if we don't get that figured out, uh, maybe in the next week or so on my channel, about how Yu-Gi-Oh has really evolved uh, over time in these last, you know, 10 years or so. And I think it's really Im imperative to look at it that way because if you look at it like from for what Yu-Gi-Oh was back in the day, I mean, back in the day, like we're talking like, let's say 2005, 2006, 2007, even like 2008, 9, and 10, uh, it would be pretty crazy to think about a card like this existing in a in a vacuum like that, right? In those particular in that particular era of Yu-Gi-Oh. But now, since Yu-Gi-Oh's kind of shifted a little bit more from like just pure resource based to being like card value based, and when I say card value based, I mean you can have like if your opponent has ten cards, or let's say let's say uh, you have ten cards in your hand. Let's say you have five or ten cards in your. I have five cards in my hand, and my opponent has ten cards in their hand, right? If my opponent has ten cards, but only one of those cards is playable or can actually do anything at that given time, well, all that advantage is really just illusionary advantage. And I think the best way to give you guys an example of that is if you think about Fire Fist. Now, if you guys think back to 2013-ish, give or take, uh, you know the the Fire Fist Mermail format. Uh, Fire Fist Mermail was, was a really crazy format, and one of the big things was obviously uh, Exiton Night, which eventually, once it was released, was a big reason why Fire Fist uh, were, weren't necessarily deterred from being played, but saw quote unquote like an indirect hit. You know, Exiton Night kind of kind of you know allowed other decks to combat them. And if you think about a deck like that, they had you know they would activate their ten keys, their ten sues, all these other cards, right? Well. Even when they activate something like that, technically that's a card that they have, but because it's not doing anything and it has no real value, that's not real advantage, you know? That's not like actually having anything. That's kind of what I like to call illusionary advantage and that, or pseudo advantage, depending on how you want to call it. And I think that's kind of how you have to think about Pot of Desires. So in this day and age of Yu-Gi-Oh, resources are really, really important. But what's more important than actually having resources is having valuable resources. And that's why in this day, in, like in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, 
combo decks are so much more prevalent than, you know, stun and anti-meta and all these other, you know, quote unquote slow decks that used to use traps back in the day is just because, because of the way the power creep works, cards have to have a much higher impact value in much fewer numbers. So like if I have a crazy three card combo that can make a, you know, an insane unbreakable board or whatever, but you have 30 cards and they just can't answer that board. Well, obviously you're going to, you know, if you had a choice between the two, you're obviously going to pick the faster combo deck with the fewer cards in that case, right? Which is obviously why uh, players have a tendency in competitive events to always strive for consistency as well as, um, you know, a high power ceiling. Like if, even if your deck is consistent, that doesn't mean it can necessarily accomplish something in terms of beating all the other decks uh, because they can't get over a certain point, you know? So like I could have a deck that consistently bricks or I can have a deck that consistently uh, is able to do the same thing, you know, draw and set traps with like a slow, boring anti-meta deck. Like if I were to make GBs or something like that uh, in this day and age of Yu-Gi-Oh! Like I love the deck, you know, God bless that deck and everything, but the reality is GB is like being a trap-based deck. It's slow. I can consistently make it so that I draw, set traps, every now and again have a monster. I mean, every now and again I'll brick, but the reality is I won't have a ton of real power behind the deck. I won't be able to do as much as all the other crazy combo decks or uh, just other decks in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! that are out right now, right? So if you think about Pot of Desires, I think the main thing that I would probably say is, or the, the general consensus from what I'm seeing and just examining the meta, is that this should be a staple. Like all the top decks uh, in Yu-Gi-Oh! So, you know, all the top decks, whether it be Blue Eyes or, you know, whatever other deck in their futures release, like ABCs um, or whatnot, or BA and whatnot, the reality is I feel like mo like the better decks will probably be playing this card both for the sake of consistency and speed, but also for the fact that like even though you're losing those resources, the cards that you draw are more important because if they can just win you the game and you're essentially just treating this card as a pot of greed. So like, let me put it this way. If this card was pot of greed, if pot of greed was at three, obviously every deck would run three of it, right? If I activate pot of greed, right, and I draw two cards, well... I don't care about what's in my deck if those two cards let me win the game, right? Like whether I'm searching, like ignoring me banishing something that I'm searching with Pot of Desires. If I'm drawing two cards uh, essentially for free, then if they can win me the game or help me win the game that turn or make some kind of crazy unbreakable board, then it doesn't matter what's in my deck. It doesn't matter what additional resources I have or could have had, right? That's the most important thing. Now the flip side of that is obviously like being, you know, having a deck that needs some kind of combo piece that you need to keep in your deck. So like if you're playing some kind of brilliant fu uh, brilliant fusion type thing and maybe you don't want to banish like Garnet or whatever other targets you have for it or certain combo pieces that you need in deck or you need to be able to search but you still only run few copies of it. So they're not necessarily placeholders kind of like Upstart Goblin is, but they're, they're still necessary, right? So that's where a lot of the conflicting things come in. Uh, obviously there's a huge paradox between this card. Um, I think you can play competitive Yu-Gi-Oh without this card. Um, you can probably play, you know, with only a couple of this or maybe even one in your deck. But I feel like it's going to get to the point where this card is probably going to be kind of like Card of Demise was uh, last format and the last two formats really. To where like even if a deck like Cosmo started using Card of Demise, that just showed the power of Card of Demise. And I feel Part of Desires is just significantly better than Card of Demise. So obviously it just makes sense that any any good deck that's playing this card is probably going to be better in most cases uh, than not playing this card, right? So uh, if all the decks, like let's say there's a tier one and a tier, you know, let's say there's a tier one and a tier 10 deck, right? Let's say the tier one deck plays it, it makes the deck better. Um, the tier 10 deck plays it, it hypothetically in that situation, let's say it makes it better. Because obviously there's some decks where um, it, just, it won't help, like you'll probably just lose because you need certain cards. Like if it's like some kind of crazy elaborate loop dot deck where you need cards, then obviously you're probably not gonna be playing it. But the point being, is that it's not proportional. Like, just because um, you gain some speed in running a lower tier deck, um, that better deck is probably also gaining a proportional or disproportional amount of speed, depending on how you look at it, um, with Pot of Desires, can, you know, speed and consistency. So, for the most part, I think I'm pretty much on the fence where, like, I feel uh, you should probably be, pl be playing Pot of Desires. I like the card. Obviously, if I had two more, I mean, if I was playing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh!, I'd probably be playing the card in any deck. I mean, everything from, like, Blue Eyes, maybe even, like, Metal Foes. I mean, when I judge regionals last weekend, I can't tell you. I think that's the first time ever in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! that I've literally been at a Yu-Gi-Oh! event where I've seen so, ev literally, every single match I saw have multiple banished piles like it was just insane uh the last time i saw that many cards being banished like ever was probably like like dad return honestly like that's probably the last time i can think of that many cards being banished or maybe chaos dragons um like literally it was just crazy to see how many banished piles they are so it really shows just how people are very invested in this card in terms of like playing this card and they feel very 
uh, very adamant that this card is very solid. And, and I definitely think that obviously you are like everything has positives and, and disadvantages, but I think the pros of running this card significantly outweigh the disadvantages in the in most cases. Like just because you banish 10 cards, um, like in some cases it could cost you the game, but in a lot of cases it probably won't if you're playing like a, top, a tier one top meta deck. I mean, if you're playing some kind of like a tier 10, you know, whatever dot deck, it may not be very beneficial to run this card. I mean, it most likely will, but in some cases it might not. And I think you should probably be playing Pot of Desires. That's just my take on the matter. Obviously, I haven't really been playing, so I can't really tell you guys anything beyond that. But uh, let me know what you guys think of Pot of Desires. I mean, I think it's a it's definitely a pretty pricey card right now, so I don't expect everyone to still be able to have it. Like I said, I only have one. I haven't been going to locals. I don't have any extra copies of this card. I'll probably just end up selling it. Uh, while it's still sitting at 70 bucks or maybe wait for like the next YCS toll, uh, you know, till people make this card appreciate potentially a little bit more and uh, we'll see. But uh, I think Pot of Desire is a very cool card. I could definitely see this card being, you know, limited to two, one or even potentially potentially banned in the future of Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, I think it's really just that good. Um, but I definitely think that you can still successfully play a deck. Uh, without it and there's definitely specific decks that definitely don't want this card so I mean uh, the pros for me definitely outweigh the cons let me know what you guys think down below in the comments uh, I have another card review right here that I'm gonna be doing um, I'm trying to film a couple videos in advance for this week since this is gonna be my first week of my internship I apologize for having no video uh, on Sunday I'm actually filming this video right now on Sunday but you guys are gonna be seeing it on Monday and I apologize for that there was no Dragon Ball Super yesterday so uh, yeah, that's why I'm doing this video today. I'll see you guys. Take care. I want to maybe get some more numbers di dialed in for Pot of Desires. I know some people right now are saying that it's okay to go over 40 cards. I want to see if that's necessarily 100% true. Um, not if it's okay, but rather if it's optimal. I, I know right now I haven't really ran the numbers uh, for it. And I haven't, I've have asked a couple people uh, to help me with that, but... Um, I know some people are saying you can run like 43 if you're running 3 Desires or 44 because you obviously still run the upstart if you're running above 40 with 3 Desires. Um, I would imagine initially just on first impressions that you probably should still just be playing 40, 3 Desires, and upstart. So I could be wrong, but I know there are some offset things that you may have to consider with Pot of Desires if you're playing it. But uh, I'll definitely have to look a little bit more into that. If I get some solid numbers, I'll probably come back and make like a follow-up video for you guys. But uh, yeah. That's really it. I'll see you guys. Follow me on Twitter at Inch95. You guys already don't. And uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow, hopefully with another video. See you guys.